welcome to bionics of surfaces or what we normally call it thermodynamics so we're going to deal with thermodynamics first and then we'll look at how that impacts surfaces and biology later first of all some thermodynamics so we'll look first of all at the laws of thermodynamics and see how that gets us going so if we look at the laws of thermodynamics we can see that there are four but the zeroth law was added afterwards so that's why it doesn't start from one which is normal um, it is however how floors go in germany zero is the ground floor but anyway the zeroth law of thermodynamics just tells us that temperature exists it just um, effectively says if we measure the temperature of one thing and we go to another object and we measure the temperature of that object and it's the same then it is actually the same because obviously if there wasn't an actual temperature scale that could exist then we wouldn't be able to logically go any further so if we measure something's temperature or if we uh, how it's formulated is if we take two objects and they're at the same temperature they're in thermal equilibrium if we move one of them and find it's in thermal equilibrium with a third object then the other combination the other two objects will also be in thermal equilibrium then it means they have the same temperature so if something's at 20 degrees another thing's at 20 degrees a third thing at 20 degrees is the same temperature as at both so it's kind of simple but it's necessary because otherwise logically it's possible that temperature didn't exist so we have to define it the first one or the second one now is that energy exists and it effectively goes further than that so energy exists and can only be transformed into other types of energy or mass so we can only transform energy we can't destroy it or magically make more of it where there wasn't any we can make it from mass but we can't make it from anything else. so the second one says that entropy exists and that is much more esoteric so entropy is the amount of randomness or a measure of the amount of randomness and it goes on to say that it always goes up and it's the thing that determines whether a process will go or will not go or in a physicist's philosophical way it's the thing that tells us which direction time is going if more entropy is created then that is the direction of positive time it's the only thing that makes us know which direction time goes otherwise there is no necessarily uh, necessary direction for time we will come back to that one later because that one is kind of complicated and the third one says at zero kelvin there is something special going on so at zero kelvin theoretically if we could get there there would be uh, things would be in the lowest possible energy state it usually refers to a perfect crystal which usually brings us to the question of can we actually get there and the answer is usually difficult because if we cool something down it will tend to get stuck in a state that isn't perfect if we take an ice crystal if we take some water and we freeze it it doesn't freeze to a single perfect crystal it freezes to some white mixture of tiny tiny crystals so we can't see through it typically with some air in it bits and things the lowest energy possible which we would need to get to zero kelvin would have one crystal and nothing else and we're now stuck we have to warm it up and cool it down again slowly to get to the perfect state so it's not trivial to get there something happened to my screen so I will pause so we have defined that temperature exists or we have decided that temperature exists because it's uh, just a framework which we use to, to predict things but uh, we also need to say what it is what is temperature we can measure it we can feel it but what is it really and um, very often it's possible to explain things in a variety of ways one of the ways that i like to use for this is randomness of motion so if we have some particles let's have a lot of them 
if we have some particles and they're all moving in different directions, like this, we can say this container of gas, I guess it is because they're particles moving in different directions. This container of gas, they can't all move away from each other. It would get a vacuum in the middle. These particles in a box are warm. They've got some kind of energy, so they've got a temperature. But those of you who've done a bit of physics will know that there's a problem with this. The problem is um, frames of reference. So if we take all of these and we make them go in the same direction, so it's not random motion. Some of them are going slower than others though. So I've drawn a different amount, but never mind. If we've got the same particles and we choose a time when they all happen to be going in the same direction, then we have a problem because these are warm and these are moving. And until they're moving randomly compared to each other, they're not warm, they're actually cold. How can I prove that? It's difficult to prove. But if we look from Einstein's th physics, he says um, we can't actually tell whether we're moving or not. It's only moving compared to the box. If we didn't have the box before they hit the box, it doesn't matter whether the box is there or not. Or in the other case, if we take this box and move it, does that heat up the gas? Not at all until some of it hits the side, then it will be going faster. In this case, until any of these gas molecules encounter something else, they are actually technically cold because they're all moving in the same direction. These, if we measure them all, are warm, but if we measure one, it's not necessarily warm because it's just moving. So how can I prove it? We can prove it by taking, making an experiment. We can't actually do this experiment, but it has been done. So if we take a box of gas and we take another box with no gas in it, so we suck all of the air out, we have a vacuum in there. We need a good vacuum in there because it's important that the things don't hit anything. Then we open a little door here. So we open this for a certain amount of time and then close it again. It's important as well that we close it again because obviously this gas is going to decide to rush out very, very quickly and it will fill up this container also very quickly. But we're not interested in what happens when it hits the other side. So we have to measure in the time that it takes for this gas molecule, which is heading towards the hole, to get to the other wall. So we need to measure something at the speed of sound. We can measure it here, for example. So we can have a look in here with our eye, with some kind of measurement method. And we want to measure what the temperature is of these particles as they pass. If we open a door here and close it again very quickly, we'll have a slug of gas, which is only moving in this direction. Some of them are going slower and some are going faster, but they're only moving in this direction because they're only the ones that happen to be moving towards the door when it was open. And if we have a long door, so let's make the door a bit longer. If we have a long door, we can make sure that they're going down this tube. If we have a short door, we have to let the particles fan out, but they're not going to hit each other. The point is they all were going towards the door when it opened. And if they haven't hit each other immediately as they go through the door, they're not going to hit each other again. There's no way for them to actually find anything to hit as long as this is a decent vacuum. So they're going to continue until they hit this wall and then the experiment's over. When they hit the wall, we've got to pump it all down again and we've got to wait till the vacuum comes back and then we can open it again and do another measurement. This experiment has actually been done. And if we measure these, we find out they're really, really cold because they are confused effectively. They were hot here. We can make them hot if we want to. This can be an oven. But while they're all moving in the same direction, they're actually cold. And when they hit the wall, they then convert to the energy that they had, which was effectively moving in this direction energy at about the speed of sound and then they hit the wall and they bounce off and they're hot again because they're all going in random directions because they hit 
some molecules or atoms in the wall over here. So we're converting heat energy to motion and back to heat again. That's interesting. And it tells us something about the nature of temperature. Temperature is only the randomness. But we can also do another thing with these gas molecules. So if we take a simple gas like argon, which is just one atom, and we heat it up, it heats up and it goes faster and the temperature goes up and it goes faster and it takes the same amount of temperature to heat it up by one degree centigrade all the time, one degree Kelvin. If we take hydrogen, things are a little bit more interesting. Hydrogen is a diatomic molecule. We have two hydrogens and there's a bond between them. It's more complicated than that. The hydrogen can do more things with the energy that it has than just move around. Argon can't react with anything. It doesn't have a bond. It can't let go. It can't do anything else. So it's simple. Hydrogen is relatively simple, but it's got more things. So what can it do? It can rotate. So it can, first of all, it can move around, which is the same. But it can also rotate. Let's have it rotating. So if it rotates end over end, I ought to get my model. Let's get a model. OK, so I've made a model of hydrogen. That's better, it's better here. I've made a model of hydrogen. It's these two white balls, and they're stuck together by a piece of rubber tube. And it can rotate like this. If it's rotating like this, it's not moving. It's rotating. And it turns out that rotating is takes a bit more energy than moving and so if we heat up our hydrogen we can move it around but we can also rotate it but if we're cold enough we can't rotate it it's to do with quantum mechanics which we'll come on to later so if we are cold enough we can't rotate it we can only translate it so if we heat it up the hydrogen gets hotter and hotter at a certain rate when we activate the rotational transition, the hydrogen can rotate as well. And so the energy that we put in, we're trying to heat it up, is distributed into rotating and translating, moving across. Oops, it's better if I do it that way. So it takes more energy per degree to heat up our hydrogen. And our hydrogen isn't finished yet. The hydrogen can also do one more thing. The bond can stretch. This one can't because it's stuck, but the bond can stretch so it can do that. And that takes even more energy to excite it. So if it gets hit by another hydrogen molecule, it can excite into a vibrational trans uh, energy and it can store that energy. And even worse, or worse, it's just a thing, it's not worse. But if we heat up our hydrogen, it now has a third thing it can do. It can vibrate as well, and so it takes even more energy to heat up the hydrogen than it did before. And so it turns out that if we heat up hydrogen, it gets hotter slower than argon does, because the argon doesn't have anything it can do with the energy apart from moving. So going onwards, we have energy, which um, can be converted into different types of energy, including mass but not created or destroyed. That's what you will have learned in physicists, in physics. And that is one of the most fundamental parts about this. It's relatively easy to see in machines, in bigger machines, although small amounts of energy are hidden. Um, but if we have it as a law of thermodynamics, it explicitly makes it difficult to design a perpetual motion machine, which was a pastime of charlatans in the past and some in the, in the present, including now. So um, if we believe in this, then it means that we can't do anything else. And if we don't, then we have to show where the energy is coming from if we create some. And then we come to entropy, which is much more complicated or much more difficult to deal with because we have some kind of randomness of our process and we have to define what it's doing. And as I said before, it, it defines 
the arrow of time effectively depending on which bit we want to define first so if we define time it tells us that entropy always increases or if we define entropy as always increases it tells us that time is always going forwards the amount of entropy globally increases but that doesn't mean it can't locally decrease so we can pay off one to get another and to get those two things together we can take my normal example for this so let's use blue because i'm going to talk about water so if we take some water whoops if we take some water and we take a piece of ice and we have it in the water and we leave it over time then we end up with just water typically or if we take a piece of ice and we so we take this completely ice and we warm it up we have completely water but if we cool it down again we can go back to complete ice so let, let's have it that way so let's draw this a little bit away from the sides to denote that it's solid and this is filling the container so this is liquid and this is solid and it's water and we can now go in either direction and I would like to explain or to try to work out how this happens so what we've said is entropy has to increase all the time and so therefore it has to increase with both of these processes both the liquid being formed and the liquid turning into a solid so let us take the forward direction first because that's how I've drawn it so we've got a solid which is molecules of water that are stuck where they are because it's solid and they're all in a certain position they can exchange slightly it can wobble a little bit because it's not at absolute zero and it's not a perfect crystal um, so we've got some entropy but when we heat it up they become a liquid and they're moving around so they're all moving around and that increases the possibilities because they can all be moving in different directions so that movement is a component of entropy because they're moving they could be moving in different directions so it can have a plus or a minus because it's a vector or it could be going in the other axis we're in three dimensions so we can have arrows in all kinds of directions different lengths so they can go at different speeds so the prob the possibilities in the liquid are way higher than they are in the solid so that has developed a problem for us so this is good because we mean we know that the amount of entropy has gone up positive in this direction when we make the liquid we get more entropy so now we need to work out how are we going to get more entropy when we cool it down so one of the things is when we cool it down one of the observations that we can make when we try to make ice one of the observations we can make is that it takes a long time if we um, just do it leave it to nature so we leave it outside and it cools down to maybe minus five in the night because we live in a place where it doesn't really get that cold um, if it's minus five you get maybe three millimeters of ice on the top of things it has to stay at that temperature for a very long time for it to generate enough ice for you to walk on it, it does happen here sometimes but not very often most years it doesn't because it doesn't stay cold enough for long enough so what's going on as the liquid the water freezes it makes bonds the water molecules make bonds to other water molecules and that gives out heat so in this way delta s is negative and delta h which is heat is also negative which means it gives it out so the delta s is the amount of entropy inside whoops inside the system and the delta h the amount of heat is um, formally for us is defined as the amount of heat that it uh, takes up 
So if it gives it out, it's negative. Um, we will fix the signs in a moment because the signs don't really matter as long as we're consistent. This is the convention that if we have heat coming out, it's negative. If we put heat in, it's positive. And obviously this is the opposite process. So this is going to be delta H is positive. So we have to um, put heat in to melt the water, to melt the ice to water, and we have to take heat out to freeze it. And the process of heating up the environment increases the entropy of the environment by making stuff move around faster. So we have decreased the amount of entropy here by necessity, but we've increased the amount of entropy outside. And if we have a process that does effectively the opposite, so the amount of entropy of our system, let's go this way, the amount of entropy is going down, but the amount of enthalpy, the amount of heat is going up. And so if we have those where they disagree, then it depends on the temperature, which one wins, because it depends on how much one is worth compared to the other one. And Conventionally, we consider delta H to be the thing that is variable. Delta H is always the same. It's the amount of heat in joules. So we keep that the same. And we put all of the sort of unknown part of it into the delta S. And that gives us an equation which I use as my favorite equation. It's the Gibbs free energy equation. So it tells us that a reaction will go if the amount of heat given out this way is high enough compared to the amount of entropy that is used up that goes down so effectively if the entropy outside goes up by more then it goes down inside we've got effectively chemistry system where we've got a container let's put it closed so this is um, a chemistry way of thinking of this so effectively, I don't know why I draw a top on there. Effectively, we've got a container that's closed, but it's a glass container or metal container. So things can't get in or out, but heat or energy can. So we can heat it up with flame from outside, or this heat can get out, but we can't add stuff or take it away. We could change our system to allow us to add things or take them away. But in chemistry, we often consider the system to be closed for stuff for matter and not closed for energy. It's not the only way of looking at it. So the opposite way of looking at it is an engineering manner, um, which is the last thing that I will mention today and we'll come back to it another time. So the problem there is that we can't define all processes by a closed system. If we have something like a piston or an engine, so we have a piston and we want to want it to do something. We want to use our maths that we're going to develop. We want to use it to tell us how much energy we can get out of this piston. We have a problem because the volume is changing and here we defined it as not being changing. So here the pressure can change, but the volume can't. And the amount of heat can change, but the amount of stuff can't. If we take a imaginary piston, a perfect piston, and we allow it to move a little bit, then the pressure can't change because it's pushing this piston against whatever, the weight, the work, but the volume can change. So we are limiting the amount of things that are changing at the same time. If we go to a more complicated case like a car engine, we would have to switch from one to the other the whole time and do a little bit of calculation, allow it to move a little bit. So allow it to move a little bit, then allow a bit more reaction to go on, allow it to heat up a bit, because we would have a problem with fixing things here. We don't usually change the amount of heat. And we don't usually let it heat up or cool down because it's a lot easier to do the calculation if you stop some of the things happening. And we've got a lot of possibilities. We've got heat coming out, got the pressure and temperature and we got the amount of material 
I'm just wondering. Okay, so we've got heat, temperature, pressure, and the amount of stuff. And if we keep some of them constant for the purposes of our thought experiment, for the purposes of our equation, it's a lot easier to deal with. In chemistry, we like to use Gibbs free energy, which uses a closed volume, but variable pressure and heat amount. So we're measuring the amount of heat going out and in. And in engineering, we often use a different one. So this is G for Gibbs free energy, and this is often U. Um, and it's because we want to calculate how much work the system is going to do. If we're doing a chemical reaction, we're not really wanting it to do work. We're wanting to make something. In this case, we're just doing a state change. We're converting our solid to a liquid. I forgot to draw the top. We're converting our solid to a liquid and not doing anything else. But to make sure that it doesn't do anything else, we have to keep it shut. Um, okay, that'll do for today. We will go on next time. Thank <music> you.